No charges for police officer who shot and killed Sudanese man in St. John's. Dollarama scores big thanks to people becoming poorer, made more than $1 billion profit in quarter three. The price of baby formula has jumped by 20% in a year, and a new report claims that Canadian mining companies are indirectly funding Wagner Group mercenaries through paying taxes to the Malian government. Good morning. It's Thursday, December 14th. I'm Nora. Here are your headlines. This morning we start with the sunrise in St. John's, which, folks, I have to say, you guys get this podcast at 10.30 a.m. That's too late for a daily news podcast. And for that, someday I won't have the kid song and dance to do every morning, and I can get you episodes a little bit earlier. Someday. Anyway, okay, first, news from an unbylined article from the Canadian press. The serious incident response team, the province's police watchdog, has ruled that there is no grounds to lay charges against a cop who shot and killed a man in St. John's earlier this year. The cop who did this is not named in the article. The man they killed was Omar Mohammed. He was Sudanese, a refugee, and had been a child soldier. The report said that he attacked an officer with a hammer before they shot him and that he, quote unquote, had two knives. The article doesn't say what that means, whether or not Mohammed had knives like tucked into his socks or if he had two knives in his backpack or if the two knives were also in his hand with the hammer. We're expected to think that this is all so threatening that it warranted police shooting and killing him. Mohammed was at an employment center the morning he was murdered. Staff called police on him because they knew that there was a warrant out for his arrest. I kind of hope the staff there feel bad about taking this decision, by the way. Anyway, within just five minutes, Mohammed was already dead. The Canadian press quotes unnamed members of the local Sudanese community who said that Mohammed needed help and he couldn't receive it. Next, another Canadian press story, and this one is written at the exact same pitch that makes me want to smash my computer and also has no byline. The headline, as it appears at CBC, reads, Dollarama sales profit way up after growing total number of stores. The line below the headline explains that the profits jumped from $1.29 billion to $1.48 billion for a single quarter, quarter three. That is so much money. But if you were hoping that the first line of the article made a comment about this jump, either that it's obscene and how dare they draw blood from the stones of people who shop at Dollarama, or that, okay, wow, great, good for you, Dollarama, you're rolling in cash, well, you'd be disappointed either way. Here are the first two lines. Quote, if domestic manufacturers and suppliers keep pushing the prices up on food and several household goods, Dollarama Inc.'s chief executive says retailers will have no choice but to raise prices too. Quote, retailers are doing their best not to push those costs onto the consumers, but retailers can only absorb so much, quote, Neil Rossi told analysts at a conference call Wednesday to discuss the company's latest results, unquote. It goes on like this, and the unnamed Canadian press reporter explains that because inflation is driving people into the ground, it's been great business for Dollarama, a company that relies on people to be poor but still need basic items. And that's it. No comment from someone who shops at Dollarama, nothing at all about how these profits are just unpaid wages, as Dollarama pays ridiculously low wages. At Glassdoor.ca, the wages are reported to start at $14 per hour and top out at $20 per hour. When I looked around online to see if any Dollarama stores are unionized, I instead found out that the BC General Employees Union is actually a shareholder of Dollarama. Back in 2021, they raised the issue of working conditions at a shareholders meeting and got 21% of other shareholders to agree with them on a proposal to improve working conditions. This is where you can see just how thick the web of capitalism is in this country. One report talked about how that was a partial victory because 21% was a high number of people, except it's like, you know, still lower than 50% didn't actually pass. Mustafa Henaway, who's an organizer based in Montreal, has been fighting for justice for Dollarama warehouse workers for a long time. He told the Canadian Labour Institute back in 2021 that Dollarama should be seen as Canada's Amazon. About one quarter of warehouse workers have been injured at work. Most get no sick days and 40% of them receive no health and safety training. 
all of these details could have been in this story. They should have been in this story, but they were deliberately left out and instead were told to brace for higher prices still because the company will have no choice but to boost prices to maintain their ridiculous profits. That is called profiteering and that is what has been happening under the guise of inflation. We know this. There's reports that have shown that this is what corporations are doing. And so, of course, the line from the CEO to shareholders about their quarter three results are going to spin this as being, okay, 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 sure, we're making a lot of money, much more than last year, but it always could actually stop happening because we might have to increase our prices even more. And maybe that will cause people to, I don't know, no longer need to buy bread and beans and stuff that you get to Dollarama. This is tiresome. I don't know who wrote that article, but you should be a bit ashamed. Okay, next, Dorcas Marfo from CTV News is reporting that baby formula has gotten 20% more expensive in the past year. The information comes from Statistics Canada, which reported that a container of formula went from $31 to $38. The price increase was related to a factory shutdown in 2022 because there was bacterial contamination at the plant that makes Similac in Michigan. The plant was closed for four months. Health Canada sought baby formula from other countries to supplement the shortage, and the policy to allow for these brands to sell food in Canada has been extended until 2024. Of course, if we're talking about international supply of formula, the question that follows is, well, what's Canada's domestic capacity to have formula made here? And so Marfo mentions one option for that. That option, Royal Canadian Milk, is a plant that is located in Kingston and makes milk products. The company is owned by Fei He International. They made a statement that said that they want to get into the formula market and they're working to get approvals to produce formula in Canada. What is bizarre is that CTV doesn't mention that Fei He had promised to produce formula from the start of their operations in Canada in 2016. In an article from 2016 at foodprocessingtechnology.com, the Fei He plant is referenced as being, quote, a new infant formula production facility. Unquote. They intended to become the first goat milk infant formula facility in all of North America. Here is how food processing technology described the facility back then. Quote, the 320,000 square foot infant formula facility includes separate production lines for goat and cow milk. The plant was planned to be developed in three phases, with phase one focusing on infant formula production from cow milk and phase two involving infant formula production from goat milk. Unquote. And the government of Ontario gave Fahey $24 million to develop the facility. They also worked with three Quebec and Ontario ministries to secure adequate goat milk supply. None of this is mentioned in the CTV article. So when CTV quotes retail expert, quote unquote, Doug Stevens, he makes it sound like this is some great coincidence that's just waiting to happen with the Fahey International plant. Quote, So there's an opportunity for the Canadian government to sit down with the owners of that plant and the Chinese government and try and work something out so that we can at least have this plant that's located in Canada supplying product to Canadians as well, unquote. Of course, the real story here then is what happened to these plans? Stevens is wrong. There doesn't necessarily need to be a conversation between the Canadian government, the plant owners and the Chinese government if they've been seeking approvals from Health Canada and, I don't know, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, I assume, to be able to produce infant formula. What's happened? Why, after seven years, is the plant still not producing formula? And what happened to the whole goat milk plan? That seemed pretty great, actually, because a lot of infants are allergic to cow's milk. Anyway, formula is a food security issue, and it should be free. Breast milk is free, and if you are one of those parents who doesn't have the lucky world of free food for the first years of a kid's life through breast milk, you end up shelling out a lot of money to feed your kid. For me, formula was considered medically necessary, and so we got our formula covered by insurance, but we also only just supplemented with formula, maybe one-fifth of the time. For a family that needs it full-time, it's criminal that it costs so much. And finally, the Globe and Mail's Jeffrey York is reporting that a new report accuses mining companies that are from Canada operating in Mali of indirectly helping the Malian government to finance the Wagner Group. The Russian mercenaries have been increasingly involved in Mali and are currently being paid $10 million per month by the military junta government there to deploy some 1,000 soldiers in that country. Overall, the report estimates that about $20 million has been sent to the Wagner Group. 
The mercenaries have been accused of participating in a massacre at Mura, a town located in the part of Mali that narrows between the borders of Mauritania and Burkina Faso. The UN has said that there's been credible reports of as many as 500 civilians killed there. Now, how are the Canadian mining companies linked to this? Well, as York says, it isn't directly. It's that Canadian gold mines are key to Mali's economy and also Mali's tax base. More than half of the country's tax revenues come from mining and Barrick Gold, ABX-T, B2 Gold Corp, BTO-T and Allied Gold Corp and AAUC-T, all Canadian mining companies that operate in Mali. Despite the coup d'etat, that ousted Mali's government, the gold mining business remains very good. Many mines are actually looking to expand. The report, called Blood Gold, argues that mining tax revenue is necessary to be able to pay for Wagner Group mercenaries. Now, I looked up the report to see who Blood Gold is, and it isn't surprising that they're specifically focused on the Wagner Group and its increasing presence in Africa. This is how they describe themselves, quote, the Blood Gold Report Research Program was launched in September 2023 to investigate the links between Western mining companies, authoritarian African governments, and Russian mercenaries. Do you have information about the Kremlin's blood gold system? Get in contact, unquote. Okay, so they're principally also concerned about Russia in general. The report authors criticize the gold mining companies for continuing to operate, even after the military coup. They must be new to the ethics of gold companies. York writes that Wagner is currently directly involved in the gold industry in Sudan and the Central African Republic, and that Mali's government has signed an agreement with Russia to build the biggest gold refinery in Western Africa. When asked about this, Mark Bristow, Barrick Gold's CEO, said the company doesn't get involved in geopolitics. He asked if all Western companies leaving Mali right now would make the most strategic sense, which, from the perspective of Western influence, is a pretty good question. Randall Chatwin, B2 Gold's senior vice president, called the report's conclusions, quote, irrational and illogical, unquote. Man, I love how these gold executives all sound like Bond villains. <laughs> Recall that Mali's military government has been moving to get rid of Western influence in Mali. Two days ago, the 10-year UN mission to try and stabilize Mali formally came to an end. That mission brought 15,000 UN soldiers to Mali. While the mission was intended to beat back rebel forces in the country's north, it mostly failed. Thousands of people were killed over that decade and hundreds of thousands have been displaced. Fighting continues. Mali has also told France to leave the country. They've ended official language status to French. Al Jazeera reports that Mali justifies Wagner's presence by saying they're training Malian soldiers to help them fight the rebel groups. Those are your headlines for Thursday, December 14th. I'm Nora. You're listening to this podcast at sandynora.com on the Real News Network podcast feed or anywhere you get your podcasts. Hope you have a wonderful Thursday. I'll talk to you tomorrow.